You know, teaching the whole child is what's successful for our kids. I think that the relationship piece is, is most important in getting to know those kids and then knowing our staff, making well-rounded students. And I think that that really is what Kansas can and redesign focuses on. So it's really kind of changed how we traditional mindset of doing one recipe for the whole school and individualizing it more, I think, is what redesign has helped us with and making our kids successful. In 2015, the Kansas State Department of Education traveled across the state, convening community conversations made up of family, business, and community partners, as well as educators, to see what they wanted to see in successful high school graduates, and what role K-12 schools should play in developing youth. From this tour, we gathered thousands of responses to help create the Kansans Can School Redesign Model. Kansas Redesign focuses on four principles student success skills, community partnerships, real-world application, and personalized learning. Starting with just seven school districts and 14 schools, Redesign has grown to over 190 schools in 71 districts, doing incredible work. The journey has not been easy, but schools will tell you it has been worth it. Join us as we share six of these compelling Redesign stories. We serve a little less than 2,000 students. About 74% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch, so we are considered high poverty. We are at times a district that's considered a majority minority district. So we usually hover right around 50% of our students white and then 50% of, of a blended makeup. One thing I've emphasized all along is making sure that we have a very systematic approach to what we do. So having four schools here in Coffeeville, we wanted every school to participate in the redesign process. Last year, we averaged three districts a week that came to visit some aspect of our district. So they were taking a tour of the middle school or the high school or the elementary. So I think the takeaways were they really wanted to replicate what we've started here in Coffeeville. Before school redesign, we were really good with state assessment scores. We were really strong in our academics and reading, but we were noticing and our teachers were noticing that the social emotional preparedness of our students when they walked in kept decreasing. And so they weren't always able to understand a frustration or articulate how to get over that frustration that they might have. We need to be able to better help these students, not just function in daily life, but be prepared to pinpoint what the struggle is and how to overcome that struggle to continue to be successful. Everything that we have done through redesign has been data-driven. We ask the teachers, we listen to their feedback. One of the things that we have really learned is that you have to pivot, you have to change because what worked yesterday might not work today. So with our stakeholders, they have been willing to adjust because they know that we are raising the next generation that will sustain this community. So they're willing to invest every moment that they can. In an analytical world and in an analytical mind, you like to have your baseline, you like to have your major, and you like to know when you've topped out. Not everyone can reach that same top line. So you have to look individual, and you have to look at the heart of that individual. And my 100% might not look like your 100%, but it is still 100%. And if we can get our minds shifted just a little bit to see that the major is not always the same, but yet we are all working towards the end goal together, we're gonna get there. The biggest thing for me is family talk time. I love the opportunity to have a wide range of students because with family talk time, it went from kindergarten to sixth grade. So you could have a multitude of kiddos, maybe about 10 kiddos, from various age levels. 
And so they got to interact and do fun things and form a family unit. So when they saw us in the halls, they were excited to see us. And then when it come time for the next grade, maybe they'll get you, you know, like, oh, I want Mrs. Lott, oh, I want Mrs. Lott. So it just gave you a chance to see every age group. In a school context, I would describe social emotional learning as an opportunity to take a look at the feelings that kiddos are having and address them and teach them how to handle those on their own. To be able to think inside themselves and see what they're going through and how that affects others. Social emotional learning is part of our day every day. So the first thing we do after we've had our announcements, we go into the lesson. So what are we thinking about today? Today it was conversations and compliments and how that works. And then we'll have a day where we get to have a meeting and just talk about what makes us happy, what makes us enjoy every day. I think it has brought us to a better level of thinking. Kids can focus on who they are. They can focus on how they feel without feeling like somebody's gonna say something bad or somebody's gonna make fun of them. It gave them a chance to focus on who they are inside. The biggest change is our social emotional platform, which has been phenomenal. It's honestly been addictive. We've seen so much growth, so much change as we have learned about adverse childhood experiences and how the kids' brains react to kids that come from a high poverty or trauma backgrounds, and it really is best practices for all kids. We continue to redesign, we continue to keep adding things. So we're in year four and we're adding things each and every semester and every year because we've become addicted to the success that we've had and we know that this is working with our kids. And it's made us learners, you know, we're constantly researching and finding out what's going on next. Really building upon the framework that we built in our launch year, I think that's been the biggest key for us. The morning announcements have grown tremendously. The counselors do a great job of giving them the information that they need to know, but then also those positive affirmations. You know, kiddos who are loved and safe come to school to learn, and kiddos who aren't come to school to be loved. And there are so many people here that are doing that. Make it a safe place to try. Even if you mess up, we'll try again soon. But give it your best and treat others with love and respect the way that you would want to be treated. The reasons why we started service learning was because we're spending time teaching the students how to be empathetic and how to think of others and how to self-regulate and how to work into groups. But we needed a way for them to practice those skills because what good is teaching without making it applicable? So we had the opportunity with redesign to what can you fix? What do you need? And so with the redesign, we got to develop this service learning project we were trying to figure out how to make service learning fit into a school structure and we were hearing we just don't have enough time to teach this or we don't have enough time to teach that. So as we were looking into service learning, we had to figure out how are we going to be able to multitask? How could we get two for one? And so we paired each of our service learning projects up with social study standards. So kindergarten where they have the standards of an awareness to self in their school then first grade branches out a little bit and it's their community. And then the next grade level reaches out further and further and further until you get to sixth grade and they're more of a global impact. Having them have their own voice in the projects and their own connections in those projects really made it take off the ground because they knew they could make an impact and it was personal to them. To inspire them to go be better for others. One of our favorite projects that we get to do here is we get to partner with our local hospital. And for them, we knew that a patient who was going through cancer treatments, there's a lot of uncertainty in their days. And so one of the great things that one of our teachers came up with was the idea of worry stones or empathy rocks. And so our students had the opportunity to design and decorate those rocks. They put inspirational words on them that might help someone get through the day. And the patients there could just take one of those rocks to know somebody is thinking about me or at least gave two seconds to make this so that my day could be a little bit better. We made rocks and we got to decorate them and give them to people in the hospital for cancer. Service learning projects are to make people feel better. Part of our project was that we got to pick a person and give them our rocks. 
I was surprised because some of them were kids and some of them were older people. When we went to the hospital, I was a little scared, but after it was fun. So through all of our projects, we've been working on the empathy and the connections to what you have done. So our students have been able to transpose that typical behavior over to their academics of a sense of pride and ownership and realizing that I can do more with more knowledge. One of the big things for Rotary is getting clean water out to rural areas. And so Iola chapter had worked with Kenya to get some uh, water filters in, in some schools and they were looking to go back and so we were trying to team up with them. We ran a fundraiser at CES that then was to buy these water filters and then they took them over to Kenya and were able to put them in several different schools. I think ultimately it affected 6,000 people who were able to get uh, clean water. We also did a program at the school so to show the kids and what previously the water situation and then what he was able to do with these filters and show them, you know, what their money was being raised for. It's definitely vital for the kids to get involved as a younger age because then it just, it creates that passion for uh, helping the community, you know, early on and then it just exponential growth from there as they grow older. There's not a playbook that you can follow, but if you have your heart in the right place and follow that, we are all in this together. And while we all have very different roles and we have so many things that are taking up a piece of the pie of our time, it is worth it in the end. And it's going to take time for this type of transformation for people to see the results that they hope for. It's making those investments and putting all that time in to have those relationships so that it can be successful. My name is Sherry Chittam, and I'm the teacher here at Age to Age. We have been here for 13 years, and it is a unique program. This year, we're like the rest of the world, and we've gone to Plan B. We are intergenerational as much as we can, but we have to work through the windows for everybody's safety. So it's a unique place. We think it's win-win. The grandmas and grandpas win, and our kindergartners win as well. For the other 12 years that we've been here, we've started at the beginning of the day by walking through the lobby, and we tried to teach the kids good social skills, good eye contact, speaking to people. Good day. You're playing with me. You're welcome. Good day. And then it's gone all the way through our day to be intergenerational whenever it's possible to be so. We've had grandma and grandpa reading every day where they get a chance to read to or with a grandma or a grandpa. And then we ended our day for the other 12 years by walking out into the lobby again and they would go and find a grandma or a grandpa to stand by and we would sing songs at the end of the day and say our goodbyes. Our county is Montgomery. Kansas is our state. I think people are all over the place in their thoughts of what intergenerational might be. Our thought is that if we are going to be intergenerational, that we want the things that we do to be beneficial for the grandmas and grandpas. We saw a big difference in their, their reading abilities because our kids had an audience every single day to read to. When we talk service, this is the ideal place to talk about how we are serving the grandmas and grandpas and they are serving us. But it gives us another way to look at the world and how even though we're five and we're six years old, we're all kind of alike too. I got five. I think something Coffeeville does very well is engage community partners and it's very important just for those students to understand what life is like outside of school and what the businesses can bring in. But it's also very important to be successful for our students to involve the expertise of others. And that is one reason why we have so many community partners here in town, is we know to educate the whole child, we don't have all the answers and we don't have all the resources that we need to do that. Our partnership with Community Health Centers of Southeast Kansas is very unique in Kansas. We're the only school district in the state 
that has a fully staffed clinic at both the elementary campus and our secondary campus. I believe the staff now is comprised of 11 employees and those are ranged from physician's assistants to nursing staff to dental health and mental health. We have a separate clinic at the high school and then we have a dedicated clinic within the elementary school. Any student can be seen in the clinic and any staff member can be seen in the clinic as well and the students are all seen cost free. Our trauma-informed, social-emotional learning approach is not only transform education, but it's really just improved the character of our building. The key thing for us was when we watched a TED Talk on adverse childhood experiences, and essentially what she's saying is, you know, when you walk through a forest and a bear jumps out, your brain goes into fight, flight, or freeze, and endorphins are released, and all the brain science that we understand, well, what if you're a five-year-old child and you live with that bear? And as your brain is developing, it is constantly in that state of crisis or fight, flight, or freeze, and it changes how the brains develop. As we learned about brain science and adverse childhood experiences, and we provided professional development for our teachers, we felt like this is the next big thing in education. Our teachers saw this. They see it every day with our kids. There is a need for socially emotional. We didn't have to convince our teachers of that. We also did student at concern meetings. So when we know students are experiencing trauma or tough situations, we arm our teachers with that information. That allows them to interact better with the students. The hardest part of social emotional learning or trauma-informed practices is changing the traditional mindset of your teachers, how they've always taught, how they were taught as a child. That's where the teacher collaboration time and the professional development was so key in building our social emotional plan here at Coffeeville. Before SEL even came to our building, in my opinion, thinking about our mental health was not at the forefront. It was, okay, it's the last minute, last thought of the day. And now we walk in the building thinking about it. Okay, let's make sure my mental health is where it needs to be today. And then we start in with the kids. I think it puts us in a better state of mind to be there for the kids when we can start thinking of our own mental health now. I have a student who sometimes needs the verbiage of SEL. They might have something going on at that moment when they first come in the building and they didn't have a way before to work through it. They had a bad moment on the bus or they had a bad moment at home, they got in trouble for whatever reason. And before, they would bring that in the classroom and it would ruin their day. And now when they come in and we start off with centering and we start off with thinking about the positive, we can now find ourselves, okay, I can let this go and I can let this make my day instead of what happened prior to. We're just now getting to where we can let those kids think about what made them grouchy and talk about what made them grouchy and think about how we can fix it so that our day doesn't get ruined before it gets started. I had been at the mental health center for quite a while and worked as a crisis therapist over there and we saw a lot of the same cycles, the same people, the same folks running into the same issues. If we want to facilitate change, if we want to facilitate long-term change, we've got to start earlier. It has to start in the schools with the people who love the kids during the day. Having that conversation as just part of our day-to-day -day language. Our kids know that if their brains are dysregulated, it's going to be really challenging for them to focus in class. What we have started seeing is the kids are able to do this by themselves now. They're able to step out of the classroom for just a minute get it done in the hallway, get back in there. And they're able to understand why it's working. We have the storm shelter, and that is our regulation room. For middle school, we needed some place that wasn't in the classrooms where the kids could go. And our goal is to keep them for the briefest amount of time. It's just a room where they can come in, they can sit and relax, they have access to a counselor and a social worker. But one of the best things that we've done is we've developed the heat index, which is our zones of regulation. Our mascot is the Golden Tornadoes, and so we use F1 through 5 for our zones of regulation, F5 being the explosive as bad as it gets. So with the heat index, it makes it easier like when you go into a storm shelter or like you're having a bad day, you're having so many emotions, the heat index basically just helps you out with how you're feeling. Sometimes it can be hard, off the heat index because you might feel like a three and a four and like feel both emotions, but it basically just helps them out with 
how you're feeling and how to help you. Especially like when you're older, you have a lot more problems. And sometimes it's like really hard to explain how you're feeling, especially with a whole bunch of emotions. And it just, it just helped a lot with me. We've gone to the storm shelter a lot and it helped us. Like we went in there and it was a horrible day. We walked out and we was way much better. We do trainings every single year with all of our students. I go into every single classroom and teach the students how to use our storm shelter. We go over the brain training, kind of how do you get your brain regulated? What does it look like when it's not regulated? How does it get to that point? I was shocked the first time we did this, how often this comes up in conversation. The kids glom onto this, they know how to use it, and they're excited to be able to explain these big feelings that they're having. They can now explain why they're having them. But with the zones of regulation, it provides a common language that our kids can use. So they can go into any staff in this school and say, I'm an F5, and that staff knows exactly what they mean. And that's so important because most of us know when we're an F4 and F5, we're not able to verbalize exactly what our big feeling is. And if you can have that one simple term, I'm an F5, and they know exactly what to do, they know exactly where to send you, it's a very proactive approach for our kids. We don't engage a student when they are dysregulated, and we don't engage a student when we are dysregulated. We want everybody to have their brains back in place, to be calm, to be able to have an, an appropriate conversation. It's not gonna be successful if that's not the case. Well, when I first came here, I wasn't sure how I was gonna feel about it. To me, not that social, emotional, that's elementary stuff. I mean, honestly, that's what I thought. But when I started to see the students actually self-regulating themselves, it, it was amazing to watch. I have very few office referrals. I find myself not raising my voice as often because of it, which I love. But it really is a neat thing to watch when you see a student that you think is about ready to lose control over something and then they don't. And so the students, by the time they get up to the high school, they know, hey, if I'm having a bad day, I need to go let someone know. So our project-based learning facility is a separate building that we had built five years ago. Students that want to participate are welcome to do. And what that looks like is it's a curriculum, so you're still using the standards that you have for, let's say, English. You still have those same standards, but the student gets to pick how they carry out that curriculum. So they get to pick the projects they want to work on. So it's really individual based. And, you know, the content, they can make theirs. I mean, they're still meet, meeting those standards, but the curriculum content in there, they can make theirs. However, I think probably the most benefit is the skills the kids learn, how to organize, stay on time, keep on track. Uh, they have to give presentations. Those are some of those big soft skills that we're really trying to teach and the kids really learn them going through that program. People ask me all the time, well, what type of kid does it fit? Does it hit that high flyer kid? Well, sure it does. Does it hit that kid that's on that lower level? Yeah, it does that as well. So there's no way that this is the target group for increasing that cognitive ability, the kids taking the content, so they're given the standards. Here's the standards you have to meet. You have to build a project that's gonna cover those and apply that stuff cognitively. And that's what we're really, really concentrating on is cognitive level of thinking. So when I was in the traditional classroom, I was very project heavy, I would say. I would teach the basic content, teach the skills, and then let them run and their final application would be a project. So that's kind of how I always took project-based learning. You can teach them and then let them create and let them have fun and let them learn along the way. You give them the parameters and then a lot of times students will go above and beyond that. Project-based learning, what it looks like here is students create things from scratch and it's 100% student-driven. I hand them the standards just like a teacher would receive. Then the students plan out their year based upon those standards, depending on what course it is. And then they create projects based around those. So they are 100% in charge of everything from start to finish. Yes, I have parameters. Yes, I'm there to help teach if need be. I'm helped to guide and facilitate. But ultimately, it is their project from start to finish. 
if they find something that they really like within a standard, then they get to elaborate on that, right? So in the regular classroom, the teacher stands up and they, they determine what it is that you learn. That you learn X, Y, Z for this specific standard. Well, the teacher may love X, the kid could care less about X, they want to learn about why. So over here, they get to do that. They get to decide, I really like this part, so I'm going to I'm going to learn about why. They do have to teach me about X and Z, but I'm okay with that. If they're focused and passionate about a certain topic, why not let them run? And we're talking about what do employers look for when they enter the field? Everything I've heard is we can train you how to run this machine. We can't train you to be on time. We can't train you to take initiative. I think really what it does is it shows that there's an alternate approach to almost anything. And that the cookie cutter model of education works for a lot, the majority, but this could work even better. And are they gonna hit road bumps? Absolutely. Are they gonna veer off the road? <laughs> yes, they do. This is the time to make mistakes. This is the time to realize I am not a person that wants to sit and read a textbook. So then when they do leave here, they already realize if I'm taking this online course or I get forced to go online, that I know that this is what I need to do in order to set myself up for success. The big thing is trying to increase that post-secondary success. You know, that's why we're here. We're wanting to uh, not only graduate the kids, but once they leave us, we want them to be successful in the future. So kind of moving from a content-based curriculum to more of a cognitive-based curriculum, we really want the kids to learn to take that content that they've learned in the classroom and be able to apply it cognitively. The biggest impact that we've had on, on uh, the school through redesign would probably be the Summit Learning Platform. In this platform, people are a little confused about how it operates. It does have a curriculum that you can manipulate to make your own, but the big thing with that is it really concentrate on cognitive skills. So it's not all about content. Like we used to just be giving out this content, like you're teaching thing about the atomic theory of matter, you know, and kids are just regurgitating this information. Well, they're getting this information, but now we're having them apply that cognitively. And so that pushes a lot of these kids 10 years down the road, the jobs that they're gonna be doing don't even exist now. So we don't know how to prepare them for those jobs, but we just wanna prepare them to be thinkers. Talk about school improvement constantly. So this is a form of school improvement. However, you're, you're taking it to another level. And if you're truly changing school and what it looks like, you're gonna have some kickback, you're gonna have some pushback because it's, it's not the norm. Everybody's been taught the same way for 70 years. So when you go and you're actually truly changing that, there's gonna be some pushback because people just don't understand it. I think one thing that really made us successful was our communication plan. We talked about redesign at every staff meeting, at every building leadership team meeting, at site council meetings, on board updates. We pushed a lot out on social media. We kept all of our stakeholders in the loop and kept that communication line open and took feedback from a lot of different areas. And that really just evolved into our plan. And I think that's one of the neat things was you create a system for constant school improvement. And that system has sustained us through COVID, through all of these different challenges. We have a plan that we built through redesign that has sustained us for constant school improvement. The advice that I would give to schools that are thinking about redesign is just jump in. It's a scary jump, but it's school improvement on steroids. That's what we like to talk about. We all do school improvement. This kind of ramps that up a little bit, but you know, establish your systems now. Start building those frameworks and systems so that when you do jump into redesign and, and you do set those systems up, it's going to be more efficient 